make your debut with the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. Never let your mum cut your hair. Never step out between parked cars. Never, ever walk under ladders. Never eat cheese before bedtime. And above all else, never, never, never tell your wife that she's wrong. Too right. And with that in mind... The Never List by Kothi Zan, a book never to be overlooked. The main characters of the book, Jennifer and Sarah, when they were, were, were 12 years old, they were in a car accident and it greatly traumatized them. The Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. Join in the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, and right here on the download. Well, I am... Um... I love this book. Um, I, it's really timely, don't you think? I mean, we, every other, uh, I don't know, it seems every other month almost, we read about people disappearing, yep. we read about y- young girls disappearing, being, being held, in, being held yeah. prisoner, um, sometimes, you know, years and years and years later, yep. uh, being found, being discovered, having been kept captive in the most awful, awful way for years, tens... 10, 20 years even. So The Never List, which is about what happens to two young young women, um, is very timely. Basically, um, they have a... Tra- they're, 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 they're good old friends from school. They have a traumatic accident on the way home from school one, one of the mothers day. killed. And one of the mothers is killed. And they kind of join forces and they draw up this Never List because they're desperate to protect themselves from harm, um, from any risk whatsoever. Yes, they become experts in assessing risk. And they draw up the never list, which is things that you never do. They research airlines and their safety, and they find the safest, statistically speaking, the safest airline to fly with, and that's who they fly with. They work out what the safest cars are to drive, the ones that are least likely to kill you if you're in an accident. They research everything. Um, They make sure when they're at college that they have ground floor rooms in case there's a fire and they can get out. All of that. They take care of every conceivable risk, but that doesn't protect them. No. That doesn't protect them because very early on in the book, and it's not giving anything away, they are kidnapped. They break their own rules. They literally get in the wrong car. They get in the wrong car. They say you never get in a taxi if you don't know the driver and you don't, but they do. They, get in, they, they break their own rule and that's it. They're incarcerated for years after that. Um, but that isn't, that isn't the whole book. I mean, most of the book takes place outside the incarceration. They, they get away. Um, but the question is what's happened to one of the girls that's been held in this house, and that becomes the central mystery of the, of the story. And the guy who, the guy right from the beginning of the story, the guy who abducted them yeah. and kept them uh, prisoner uh, in a cellar with two other young girls mm. um, for so many he's years. He's up for parole. He's, well, he, he's been convicted, um, and, but he's, while he's been in prison, he's apparently had a, a, a miraculous religious conversion. Mm. He has become... You know, he's become aware of Christ, he's terribly sorry about what he's done, blah, blah, blah. And it becomes obvious that he's up for parole and this time he might just get it, which means he'll be out on the streets again. So the abiding mystery of what happened to one of the girls who's never been found, um, and they all suspect he he, he murdered and disposed Mm -hmm. of the body, Uh, we don't know that for sure, the abiding concern of of, of one of the the girls who who survived is to find out what happened to her because if if she can prove that she was murdered, then this guy won't get out because he's been lying about it. It's a very, very cleverly constructed story and very atmospheric. And and what's really good about the central character is, I mean, she's become virtually housebound because of her, because of what happened to her, and and she's actually she, catatonic. She's catatonic, fear, absolutely. Yeah. But she has to, she, she she has to take her courage in her hands, and she has to get out into the real world to track down what happened to this girl. And and, and in doing so, she confronts her fears and her phobias. And it's it works on so many levels. This story, and it's got a really satisfying finish. Yeah. Because you don't see it coming. So from never taking any risks at all, i.e. the never list, absolutely. Don't do this, don't do that. She has to. They have to. They, no, they, they 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 fall into peril anyway. Yes. And when that's over, she has to take risks to remove the whole thing properly from her life. It's very good. When we got out of the hospital, we worked on our project in earnest. At the school library, we found almanacs, medical journals, and even a book of actuarial tables from 1987. We gathered data, we computed, and we recorded, filling up line after line with the raw evidence of human vulnerability. The journals were initially divided into eight basic categories, but as we got older, We learned with horror how many things there were that were worse than plane crashes, household accidents, and cancer. 
in stone silence and after careful deliberation, as we sat in the sunny, cheerful window seat of my bright attic bedroom, Jennifer wrote out new headings in bold black letters with her sharpie, abduction, rape, and murder. The statistics gave us such comfort. Knowledge is power, after all. We knew we had a one in two million chance of being killed by a tornado, a one in 310,000 chance of dying in a plane crash, and a one in 500,000 chance of being killed by an asteroid hitting Earth. In our warped view of probability, the very fact that we had memorized this endless slate of figures somehow changed our odds for the better. Magical thinking, our therapists would later call it, in the year after I came home to find all 17 of the journals in a pile on our kitchen table, and both my parents sitting there waiting with tears in their eyes. Get the books online or in store from WH Smith for lots of exclusive bonus content. Or, if you have an e-reader, you can download the e-books today from WH Smith or on the free Kobo app. So, this edition we're focusing on The Never List by Kothi Zan. But what's keeping you turning the pages this spring? My name's Kelvin Jones. A uh, book I read recently is Dominion by C.J. Sansom, and that was interesting. It took what you know now and put it all out of context. Everything that you know about your world wouldn't be like this if the events in the book had happened. It's like a historical what-if. Okay, one of my favourite authors is Alexander McCall Smith. I absolutely love the Great Detective Agency series that he wrote. And then I was lucky enough to hear him speak last year at a literary festival. And he was mentioning his Scotland Street series, which are absolutely fabulous. You can dip in and out. You don't have to have read them all. All the stories are standalone. And they're just hysterical. Absolutely love those. And another book that I've really loved is called Sacred Hearts by Sarah Dunvant. This is set in a, a convent in Italy uh, at the time of the Italian Reformation. So it's a time in history that I knew very little about. And I must admit, life in a convent was something that I hadn't thought would be the subject I'd get to be so interested in. But it was absolutely fascinating because the book went into not only the history of the time, um, but also the politics of life within a convent, which were absolutely astounding. At the heart of the, of the book, there's also a really lovely love story. Keep your thoughts coming in via the social media. Just search the Richard and Judy Book Club. But time to hear some more from Kothi, who juggled working full-time with writing her book, the research for which took her to some surprising and sometimes horrific places. How much was your story inspired by one of the many real-life cases of long-term abductions and, and the abuse of young women? Well, it was, it was really inspired by very many of them because um, I really it began with Silence of the Lambs. I, just, uh, I, I saw that film and I couldn't believe that such horrible things existed. And, and after that, I became quite interested in all of the real-life cases and I followed those news stories uh, from the from the first news reports, you know, well past those uh, uh, the initial you know splash in the news, I would I would track the stories and follow them and find out what happened to the women afterwards, and that included, you know, Natasha Kampusch in Austria, Elizabeth Fritzel, uh, also in Austria, uh, Elizabeth Smart, J C Lee Dugard, you know, unfortunately there are more stories now every day. Um, and I always just wondered how could people live through those experiences? What did they have to do in order to survive psychologically uh, and physically? Uh, how did they have to manipulate their captors? And then I, I was really, I just wondered how do they pick up the pieces of their life afterwards? And that was what inspired the book the most. I just couldn't imagine how anybody could continue on after such an experience and uh, that's where the character of Sarah came from. The torture scenes that you've written in this book are very powerful and obviously they're sickening. Did you need to go for a long walk in the fresh air after you'd written them? Yeah I, I did a lot of long walks in the in the course of uh, writing this book and so it was you know and I always felt that actually some of the more emotional scenes um, were in a way more painful. Um, I definitely, when I, when I wrote the 
torture scenes, I didn't want to be gratuitous about it. Um, so I was always very careful to be suggestive, which I actually think is, you know, more effective, has a, a more effective uh, impact on the reader because then they put their own worst nightmares and they use their own imaginations. Um, but I, and I also, I wanted to, I wanted it to be, uh, to me it is a feminist book and so I didn't, I didn't want it to be just exploitative of the characters as well. What do you think it is about these dreadful crimes that seems to make them an exclusively male preserve? Well, you know, my feeling has always been that um, that people who need to feel complete power over someone else feel that way because they feel a lack of power in their own lives. And so I have noticed um, that in a lot of these cases, the perpetrators are people who you know, a lot of times it is white male, males who have been, you know, brought up to expect to be in a powerful position. And then when things don't work out for them, uh, you know, they, they, they look for that power elsewhere. And they look for someone who's more physically vulnerable and that they can have control over. Um, you know, there are very often women accomplices uh in some of those stories, a lot of wives are involved, but it is true that I can't think of an instance where the woman was the abductor. I became I became pretty obsessed with the topic, um, and so even though the stories were very difficult, there, for some reason I just I felt that I had to understand this question. So I read every available memoir uh, for women who had been through this experience, and I. Uh, read the transcripts from court cases w when they had them, um, and I I also researched quite a bit uh, about the psychology of trauma recovery generally, um, and you know that includes many other stories that are also horrific, whether it's domestic abuse or or sexual abuse. Um, you know, there's trauma takes many forms and the recovery process uh, is somewhat similar in all of them. And so it was quite painful, but uh, I felt that that helped me to really um, try to understand what, what these women had gone through and helped me to build the character. Um, I also did a lot of research on BDSM, you know, bondage, discipline, sadomasochism, and for that, most of the research I actually did on websites that were dedicated to the topic, and I just kept thinking, you know, oh, I can take anything, I've read all of these, no nothing that people do to other people could possibly surprise me, and then I would find another website, and there would be something so shocking to me that I would just have to close my computer <laughs> for a while. Uh, so... It was definitely an, an emotionally trying experience, but I felt that, you know, by having my own emotions raw like that, it, it could help me to translate that, those feelings, onto the page. Is your next novel going to be as dark as The Nevelist, or <laughs> will you go for a couple of laughs this time? Uh, yeah, maybe one day I'll, I'll write something lighthearted, but not, not next time. My next book is, um, you know, I'm, I'm working on it right now. And it's also very dark. It's different from this book, though it deals with a lot of the same themes of power and control and guilt. And, you know, I guess you, you kind of, as a writer, I think I have some of these, I'm working with some of these same interests and obsessions. So um, it's dark. It's it's pretty twisted. Um, but, and, and and I'm just personally as a reader interested in suspense and and so yeah, there's a lot of that in there okay next time how about you meet me in st louis judy anytime and not only for the purposes of our next read sisterland <laughs> well no, not in the in the age of the internet they're not my harshest critics but they're not my gentlest critics either. So, come back to hear New York Times bestseller Curtis Sittenfeld. What a great writer she is. Answer some of your questions on the Richard and Judy Book Club, exclusive to WH Smith. We give you so much more than any other bookshop. Get extra notes at the back of every Richard and Judy recommendation. 
exclusive to WH Smith.